so so there's just really mm. you know difficult contradictory things happening among progressive communities here mm. you know in relation so i mean i i don't think that there's a lot of real thinking about anti imperialism mm. why that is central mm. to any progressive social movement work you do here mm. now you can not you can't do feminism without thinking about imperialism mm. you can't do worker organizing without thinking and you can't do any of those things without actually taking the fact of imperial war and what's going on in its name mm. which affects all of us you know in very different ways seriously Probably I should just start with, with uh, you know, saying something about my own um, intellectual and political genealogy, which I think is really crucial in understanding the kinds of questions I'm asking and the kinds of analysis that I'm trying to get through, right? Okay. So I think that um, growing up in India and uh, coming to the U.S. via Nigeria, which is what I did. I taught high school in Nigeria before I came here as a student. Um, growing up in India, it was very clear to me that um, if I was interested in any kind of questions of freedom or liberation, they had to take on, I had to take on um, decolonization as a deep intellectual epistemological question. Because even though I grew up as past, part of the post-independence generation, you know, all we had at that time was formal decolonization, which meant we weren't necessarily um, thinking about all of the deep ways in which colonization actually affects a people beyond, um, I don't know, beyond self-governance, yes. right, at the state level. What are the ways in which people who are formally colonized and who've been subjected to various forms of domination um, have to think about decolonization at psychic levels, at social levels, in terms of um, racialized gender ideologies, um, in terms of the knowledges being produced, which, um, you know, the knowledges being produced, the kinds of things that are taught in the school system become very crucial in terms of how people can imagine themselves. Yeah. So. Growing up there and experiencing also a different colonized culture, which was in Nigeria, mm. um, where I taught high school and where I had to justify to myself teaching Keats and Shelley and Shakespeare mm. to Nigerian students for whom this was a very far stretch. Not that it wasn't for me when I was in school in India, but... Uh, I think the combination of those experiences really um, brought home the significance of thinking about history and specifically colonial legacies okay, yeah. in any liberation project yeah. for me. So then I come to the US and one of the things I have to do almost immediately <clears throat> is um, learn the script of race and racism in the United States. And, uh, and this is a new script. It's not that I don't understand a little bit of it because I've lived in Nigeria as an Indian in a black country with Europeans in very dominant role, mm. even then. But, you know, the script of American racism is very particular. Mm. And in order to understand that, you, you really have to, as somebody from the outside, as somebody from the South, you know, it was very important that I actually teach myself about the counter-narratives 
mm. or the history from below of this country in order to both understand how um, racial and economic domination worked and where I fit in as an immigrant and as a person from the South. Um, and so that kind of um, thinking about colonial legacies then comes together with thinking about what those legacies mean in the context of a hegemonic culture in the North and not any old culture, the United States. Mm. How do you keep uh, in your uh, mind, in your analysis, in the way you make sense of the world, how do you keep questions of um, the profound uh, gendered structure of society together with colonial legacies, capitalist scripts, racialized ideologies, and nationalisms. How do you keep those things together and use that as a frame to understand what's going on? So a lot of my work then began by asking the question, so what am I reading in terms of feminist theory? You know, what is, what is hegemonic feminist theory, however one wants to define that, teaching me? And what it was teaching me was that uh, it was part that there was a way in which the focus, a particular kind of focus on gender, as non-racialized, as non-classed, right, uh, and as sometimes um, sort of uh, non-racialized, non-classed, and. Um, and also uh, taken for granted as U.S. American. There was no space really for thinking about marginalized constituencies of women who, in my opinion, very often um, were, the, were poor working class, um, of color in, in the North, and um, often peasant working class workers in the South, um, that there wasn't a space for understanding these communities of women as critical communities with agency, having their own understanding of how they are located in, in the situation they're in. That is, that they have an understanding and reading of power. Right? Because what I started finding was that the, the, the kind of feminist theory or gender analysis that I was subjected to or, or that I was um, um, exposed to really, um, really ended up colonizing these groups of women yeah. in order to construct, you know, and as you know, some of my old work, in order to construct this, um, this notion of the free, liberated Western feminist. Yeah. Okay. Socialist feminists, while paying attention to questions of class and women workers, um, very often did not pay attention to questions of colonialism and race. So, so while you know uh, there was a piece of it there for me that was important mm. in the reading um, of capitalism and the naturalized understanding how capitalism and capitalist values become naturalized mm. in the world we live in and that they allow people actually with privileges mm -hmm. to um, either construct people without those privileges um, as pure victims mm -hmm. or as um, people uh, deserving of charity mm -hmm. or as people who have no critical understanding of power mm -hmm. and how to fight it. You know, that, that seemed to be um, what I was reading. Um, so that's actually some of the ways in which I get to um, thinking about what it means to speak of um, global capitalism, corporate globalization right now, mm -hmm. and um, of the possibility and the potential of mm -hmm transnational anti-capitalist feminist struggle, mm. right? Um, 
that's how I get to this place where I'm, you know, asking the questions of what is it, for instance, about how colonial, past colo historical colonialisms, how do historical con colonialisms construct um, themselves and their relations of rule on the basis of racialized gender? Mm. Okay. That becomes an important question. And how does that then get, um, get picked up in the decades following? Mm. Um, and how, does, how do capitalist um, relations of rule, mm. in fact, utilize those gendered and racialized colonial legacies in order to now once again create surplus labor, once again create third world poor women as the, the preferred workforce. Um, and, and can we actually talk about anti-capitalist struggle without understanding the importance of race, gender, colonial legacies in that struggle? So that, to me, is a really crucial question. And so one way to think about it is now, in the world that we live in now, how does the colonial traffic in the imperial, right? How do imperialist projects now, imperialism, it seems to me that imperialism, militarism, and globalization, huh? corporate, capitalist, corporate, global, economic globalization, are now hand in hand right now, right? So. Um, we could, there's a lot of people who will talk about those three things as mm. three different things, mm. okay? But for me, first of all, we need to understand how those three um, systems, modes of operation, practices, right, uh, interconnect and <clears throat> sustain each other and how at the heart of some of those practices, right, mm are um, gendered and heteronormative mm. sexual politics and ideologies, that that cements. So um, the kind of imperialism and militarism we see now requires a sort of construction of masculinity. Mm. It requires um, thinking about uh, exactly actually mobilizing the old colonial ideologies mm. of um, you know, white men rescuing brown women from brown men. Mm. It's a very old trope. It gets mobilized again, mm. over and over. And that trope actually is very crucial in uh, creating uh, hegemonic consent. Mm. It, it's important to not disconnect, I guess, uh, analysis of, uh, historical analysis of racialized gender that um, you know, we now have an incredible amount of, of literature on colonial legacies of racialized gender in different contexts in the world, you know, to not disconnect that work mm. from the work that's happening now, which is, which people would call anti-globalization work or anti-capitalist work, you know. So while on the one hand, I think that the whole tradition of European Marxism and, um, you know, the, the, uh, um, you know, the left probably, I don't know enough about the left in Europe, but I know a little bit about the left in the US. I also know a little bit about the left in India. Um, and that uh, a lot of the sort of critiques of the left, um, both in India and in the US, um, have come from uh, women within those struggles who um, have made it very clear that in fact, the kind of way the revolutionary subject is defined or even the reading of how power works, you know, is faulty because it is not gender, yeah. right? So um, some of the more interesting like union work happening right now, I think in the US is with the service um, uh, industrial employees union where they figured out that they can't not pay attention, right, to um, the fact that women are the dominant workers in certain industries, like the health and the service industries, one, and two, that immigrant labor is also fundamental in this country, 
to certain industries. So you cannot then go in and organize women and immigrants on the same kind of platform because their experiences, in fact, are not exactly the same. So it's interesting because that then, it's a very on-the-ground example of how the moment you start paying attention to questions of gender and race, right, your practical politics, right, you have to change. Mm. And, uh, and, and then if you pay attention to that, the practical politics, and theorize from there, right, then you, you have a way to intervene in the, the larger discourses of the left. One of the ways that capitalism in this country, at least, you know, um, is naturalized or normalized, meaning people breathe uh, the values uh, that are created and in the air around them and, and, and think that that is what democracy is rather than it's connected to an economic structure with, which has a particular value system attached to it, right? Part of the way that is done, I think, is um, by mystifying, right, how power functions, by not, not allowing, to, by making it invisible, by not allowing us to actually see it. And, and so there are false categories that get created, I think, as one way that that kind of mystification works, right? So, yeah, I mean, to the extent that we allow, um, you know, we allow ourselves to, in fact, think in some of those rather rigid categories of worker who is non-gendered or uh, a capitalist who's also non-gendered and non-racialized, non, I don't know, not, not located in any place, placeless, right? Mm. Then we are actually keeping the whole system going. I mean, the, the, the way change occurs, I think, is um, if people are able to think very carefully um, in the place that they are in about what is happening in most detailed forms, what is happening to the community that they are a part of, and how is that connected to what's happening in the world. There, there are real continuities, I think, between uh, how uh, globalization and capitalism has worked for centuries now, in fact. Okay, so I don't think that there's been a marked like break in that. I do think, though, that now, with the sort of almost monopoly of certain corporations and the power of um, transnational governance institutions like World Bank and uh, IMF, which are again governed by very particular um, Western uh, countries, um, that with that and with the fact that um, you know the largest economies in the world are now corporate economies and not countries, not the economies of countries. So clearly there's been a major shift in terms of um, uh, economic and therefore political power. So yes, there has been that shift. The effect, <clears throat> some people argue I think that, that, that nation states therefore um, have no role or, or are much less important. Um, than corporations. I would say that nation states still continue to play a very significant role, usually as the, well always, as the mediating force between corporations and the, the, um, the way labor is organized in, 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 in any country, really. So I think that, um, you know, in um, various parts of the South, uh, free trade zones are only possible because the state, uh, in fact, is making them possible. So without the state, there would be no free trade zones really possible. Mm -hmm. And the state provides a lot of the surveillance and policing mechanisms 
that are then required by corporations um, in order to, um, to engage in the level of exploitation that they engage in and the level of profit making that results from it, right? So yeah, I think that has changed. I think that with that level of corporatization, if you were thinking specifically of what's happening with um, you know, women workers um, in factories and so on, um, people have talked about there being this incredible shift from um, privatized patriarchal yeah. relations uh, within the family to what, what is referred to as public patriarchy. So, um, so the factory or the corporation becomes the patriarch who is taking care of the women who are um, employed. And um, does the, is this better or worse? Well, um, some of the research shows that it's better in the sense that women have an economic, have some income and perhaps can therefore have a little bit of uh, uh, autonomy. On the other hand, um, is this liberation? No, because pub public pat patriarchs have similar paternal, uh, paternalistic and uh, controlling and surveillance um, relationships in place. I think what's interesting question then is in the shift from private or familial patriarchal structures to this kind of public you know, if you were to call it public, um, corporatized, I would say more, less public, more corporatized patriarchal structures, whether in fact um, that shift means that there is really uh, uh, an accelerated form of control that happens in the name of, you know, uh, young girls getting salaries, getting money, you know, participating in beauty contests, you know, all, all of the kinds of ideologies that then uh, support uh, the naturalization mm. of capitalist culture, I think, mm. right? And th the consumerism that has to be present mm. in order for capitalism to actually function well, mm. right? And what's interesting to me is how, um, so how it is that, 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 uh, we, wherever we are located, um, very rarely think of ourselves, our roles as consumers, as being central to the way capitalism works. And here's another, you know, gendered lens, which is uh, how capitalism, uh, how capitalist corporate uh, companies go after women as consumers. To be a consumer at the level of having access to lots of brands of things becomes a sign of um, liberation or freedom to choose, right? Versus uh, any kind of understanding of, of uh, what it means to live as, a, as an individual who can make you know, choices about your own life uh, yeah. on your own which you cannot. You can choose among products, you cannot choose a lot of stuff yeah. about your life, yeah. really. Um, so I think there's been an exacerbation of, of an acceleration of forms of exploitation and uh, colonization, really, um, which are continuous with what used to, I mean, the kind of strategies that are used sometimes are you know, um, old, old strategies of containment, of harassment, of physical violence. I mean, the same sorts of things that, you know, uh, the British and the Spanish and everybody else used to subdue subject populations, you know, except now it's happening in different sites. Mm. Um, and we, uh, because media is so corporate controlled, uh, almost everywhere in the world, you know. Um, because of that, 
people don't get to actually see the connections between what is happening in terms of struggles and, and pushbacks that are happening by uh, you know marginalized people all over the world mm. um, and and people who are in fact maybe there are similar corporations that are this or the same you know uh, that are being fought back against mm. and yet if, if you don't see it then you don't connect the dots mm. so then it sees it, it seems like um, these isolated struggles you know that people in Mexico have Mm. and people in India have and people in Sri Lanka have and it's really not in fact concerted or connected in any way so I think and I think some of the most interesting forms of resistance is the transnational connection that is happening among women workers but also among uh, women in sex work specifically mm. and prostitution that's happening transnationally among uh, women who are, you know, one of the largest growth industries for third world women has been the maid industry, domestic mm. uh, workers who, from the Philippines and elsewhere, um, from Asia mm. to the Middle East and to Europe and to the US as well. All of these, these conduits are now in place, right? And all of these border crossings, mm. right? Which are very much, I think, a part of um, this particular uh, stage of corporate globalization mm. you know and uh, so certain bodies can cross under certain conditions mm. and um, um, and it seems like this this is freedom that you're free to cross right versus well you have to cross in order mm. to sustain yourself and your family back home sometimes. Mm. I mean, I, w I wanted to talk a little bit actually about something else <coughs> which is interesting, which shows um, something different about what's happening now with corporate globalization. Mm. And, and that is uh, the growth of the global prison industry. You know, and it is now, it is a global prison industry. Through the 70s, 80s and 90s, you know, the counterpart of structural adjustment in the in the south was privatization in the north and specifically in the United States right and the same kind of economic restructuring has happened here as has happened there except you know again for those uh, for the kind of um, um, I don't know ideas about superpower and privilege and and uh, whatever to work. Um, it it is important that most people don't see that there has been real economic restructuring, which is totally similar to the South, because of course mm. this again a, a, col a the trace of the colonial and the imperial. You know, mm. well over there all of these devastating things have happened. Mm. you know in Bolivia and all these places but here you know it's just one it's either bad luck that that you know uh, middle managers are losing their jobs or uh, a particularly uh, retrograde company who is um, shutting up uh, shop and moving somewhere else you know mm. um, but there has been a, a period of structural readjustment that mm. is economic restructuring that has happened in this country and it has uh, the, the the primary form it has taken is of course deregulation and privatization and the growth of the global prison industry in that, in that sense is very very instructive I think um, at the time when um, the 80s and 90s in the US when um, you know uh, people were losing their jobs, there was all kinds of furor about economic depression, economic uh, downsizing, all of those things. Um, the prison industry was in an economic boom, okay, mm. exactly the same time. Mm. Um, so, and in the 1990s, while the crime rate in the United States went down, mm. right, the um, prison population doubled. Okay, and uh, before actually it's interesting because you know people now 
are talking about the privatization of prisons, yeah. you know, which basically means the uh, taking over of of uh, the prison system by private corporations, right? So um, for-profit corporations, and so there weren't there were actually no privately owned prisons in the United States before I think something like 1983. And now it's like a boom industry. It's huge. Um, there are prototypes that are being uh, sort of um, uh, exported to mm. off, off privatized prison systems, exported to other countries. So Mexico is one, and uh, I think Malaysia was another. And, and now I'm going to talk specifically about the U.S. and what I, you know, what I see as the 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 present condition here which is um that there's a real dovetailing between domestic and foreign policy mm. of the bush war state right now right so so we are we have been for a long time creating both internal and external enemies and and interestingly enough very often they look alike mm. right the internal and the external enemies and I think that right now, corporate globalization, corporate uh, rule in this country goes together with the milit militarization of everyday life, right? And of um, the imperial project outside, yeah. imperial wars outside. So um, private prisons become a part of um, the way um, way corporate America specifically um, flourishes and the way it ties into its larger imperial um, aspirations. There, is, there are levels of surveillance now in place everywhere like that didn't used to be the case. So um, health services, uh, state health services, um, hospitals, um, school systems, um, and uh, welfare offices, you know, all, all of those things are all, um, are all um, under surveillance and um, uh, sort of managed uh, in terms of internal threats. So who is an internal threat becomes a very big question phones are being tapped, you know, I mean, just, just stuff like that. Military recruiters, uh, it's now okay for military recruiters to go into public school systems to recruit young people for the military. Um, it is, uh, and, and again, very gendered practice, right? Because um, it, it, it immediately constructs notions of who, um, what kind of masculinities are desired masculinities, right? And if, and the military or the prison become options then for young men of color, young mm. African-American Latinos, okay? Um, so there, there's some like ridiculous, uh, incredible statistics, like um, two thirds of African-American men are, young men uh, are either in prison, on parole, or uh, in, in some way connected to the prison system. Two thirds, one third are in college as compared to one third. Um, so it's, it's almost like there are things happening which, is, which, which um, are disappearing, uh, you know, entire generations of groups of people. And the same, the, there's a rise of private immigrant detention centers. Uh, privatized immigrant dis detention centers all along the the California, uh, Texas, Mexico border. Okay, and again, what do privatized detention centers do? They look to fill beds. So there's been an enormous the the recent shift has been, in in, in sort of just thinking about what prisons mean. There's been a recent shift in uh, thinking about rehabilitation. Mm 
right, as the object of going to prison to basically um, uh, criminalization, permanent criminalization, because the point is to have people in prisons to like Marriott to fill beds. Mm. Um, and that's a very, and again, why is this relevant for feminist work? Well, um, because similar racialized and gendered ideologies are being mobilized, that were mobilized pre-9-11 and post-9-11 as well. Um, and also there is, women are the fastest rising population in prisons. And now this is not just US, but this is globally. More women are arrested for, are, um, arrested for drug arrests than men. And um, the, some of the research shows that it's in fact women who are um, carrying drugs across borders. Sometimes, like Jamaican, they call drug mules. Jamaican women, Mexican women, for whom this is the only form of income, who carry drugs either for their boyfriends or for somebody else in power across borders who get caught and then get thrown in jail and then stay there for a very long time. So, and again, poor women from the South, usually. Um, and th that kind of, you see, because there's a continuity between the war on drugs and war on terror and all of those things, so it's logical that in fact, um, these are the people who get um, caught in it. There's, they are still the most marginalized, they're still the most you know, vulnerable in many ways. The southern states have the largest growing private prison industry in the country. And again, you can understand why. How is this connected? Because prison labor is cheap labor, or free labor sometimes, in fact. So you have uh, private corporations, and you don't have any public control or state control or anything on it, and the prisoners um, are part of chain gangs, they're part of labor uh, forces for huge numbers of corporations in the South. So there's a whole pool here of, um, you know, it's continuity with slavery hmm. in, in many ways. There's even a place in North Carolina that used to be a plantation in the 1850s, right, which had uh, some of the largest number of slaves. You know, then you outlaw slavery and supposedly it's done. It's now taken over by the Corrections Corporation of America and made into a private prison, which houses largely young African-American men that have been shipped, outsourced from the North, from Connecticut. So here, a whole other, you know, incarnation of, uh, of labor patterns that have, you know, very long history in this, in this country and are devastating for many communities of color. So, I mean, you asked me what were some of the more, um, from where I sit, some of the more interesting and um, uh, important, really crucial struggles are um, struggles around the prison industrial complex in this country. This is where a lot of, um, a lot of uh, young people of color um, are involved, in fact. Um, and it's interesting because it's not yet seen as part of the anti-globalization movement or struggle, mm -hmm. where it seems to me that it's, it's perfectly compatible and connected. Mm -hmm. You know? Um, I mean, this is the other thing about anti-capitalist struggle. I think that we need to widen the range of how we understand um, the profoundly devastating effects of capitalist exploitation. I mean, because the commun because the surveillance industry and and the criminal indus criminalization industry is totally connected to the um, uh, to the way labor is organized in mm. this country and to the way it's organized around the world. 
and the fact that different countries and, and often authoritarian regimes in different countries are now reproducing the same kinds of prison systems and privatizing prison systems in the same way, you know, yeah. I think shows us that we're moving in this uh, direction that is really, really dangerous. The organization that I work with, yeah. what they do is, is really try to prevent the, privatized, the private industries and the corporations from coming in and taking over a prison. Yeah. So, um, so they, they work with the communities uh, on the ground, work with um, legislators, uh, put pressure on local, county, state governments to, uh, to not allow this mm. to happen and it is it is really precisely in the south because the south is um, such a such an important place in this country for prison privatization you know um, so and and we've been successful in a lot of different places um, there was a move there was a, a coalition with a student group um, where where students in different universities organized against um, sort of companies that were connected to the, um, like the, the Corrections Corporation, which is the largest uh, prison privatizer in the world. Um, so Sedexo, mm. uh, which provided a lot of the food services in, which does actually provide food services, you know, outsourcing of, which all universities are doing. That's the other, the corporatization of the university. Um, they organized uh, uh, to boycott uh, food services and Sodexo and Sodexo pulled out, mm. you know. So, so, so there have been um, coalitions among different uh, groups in different sites to target particular corporations and the building of um, immigrant detention centers and of um, prisons or private prisons. But I think that it has to do with with still fighting at the state level, at the yeah. legislature level, at getting people to in fact see that the community um, does not want this entity to exist. Privatization threatens democracy. Where private good substitutes for the public good is a profound way in which corporatization and globalization is working now and that if one doesn't fight it, if you do not, in fact, see that this is something that permeates everywhere, right? Yeah. Um, that that uh, we lose we lose the battle because if we buy into the rhetoric of, well, you privatize something, then the competition uh, increases the output and it's more efficient and you know all of that stuff. And you don't keep in mind that when you privatize something, then as a citizen, you in fact have no rights in relation to what the private company is doing. So, I mean, right now there's, there's you know, people are privatizing um, absolutely educational systems. You know, there are uh, health systems, medical systems, um, public parks, you know, uh, transportation services. You know, all of which, there, there are struggles, I, I mean, there are struggles in this country around all of that stuff, you know, pushing that, pushing back that level of privatization because it is, it deeply threatens uh, some kind of understanding that, that you know, there has to be, um, that's, that democratic citizenship is about the ability to participate in decision making about your life and about having accountability uh, between you as a citizen and your governance structure, whatever mm. the governance structure is, mm. and that is totally undercut mm. by this the, the this form of privatization, which is you know, and people who are who are part of private of this move, you know, which is again a, a central part of how um, corporatization works here. I think people who are part of that are in fact. Um, very aware of this and, and are very brilliant at you know coming up with language that shifts the terrain of struggle or discourse or even understanding 
to somewhere else. So, you know, you don't talk about people losing rights. You talk about people getting more efficient services. You know, you, you, don't, you don't talk about um, accountability. You don't talk about the fact that, you know, uh, in privatized spaces, it's people who have wealth and money who have a say. And people who don't have wealth and money have no say, have none whatsoever. So your citizenship is determined by your wealth and your class privilege. It's not, you know, just because you happen to live in something that calls itself a democracy. It's nothing to do with, you know, what you, uh, really the kind of rights you are afforded. Mm. And, and, and so if you don't take on privatization in a central way, I think it, it becomes, um, if you see it merely as like an economic solution or something to do with efficiency, rather than it erodes some very, very central kind of ways of thinking about mm. the public good mm. or about the public, you know, um, public responsibility, public whatever, relationships, all of those things, you know, it, it, it's a real, it's really quite, quite uh, insidious, mm -hmm. actually. You know, I... Uh, I am not uh, squeamish about militant tactics. So in other words, I don't, I don't think one can be a um, nice girl and make any revolutionary change. Um, so I, I don't think that, um, you know, deliberate um, destruction or um, violence against someone else, you know, um, is, is um, necessary in order to actually uh, create militant tactics and get attention from the media, if that's part of what one is trying to do. Um, I think that the Seattle, the Seattle demonstrations were really interesting because um, first of all, it was a coalition of like a zillion different sets of people and communities. And the fact that this happened and that the organizers were able to bring so many people together was amazing and crucial because it, it was one of the first place, first things that happened in the US, I think, after the 60s, honestly, that made people sit up and think, oh, well, there are enough people who are really thinking critically about what's going on and who are willing to take certain kinds of stands. So one of the effects of that, I think, if you were paying attention and you know, if you cared about these things, one of the effects of that was to show people that in fact the state and the transnational institutions do not have that kind of absolute power necessarily. Okay, in terms of people's hearts and minds, that power is not there. It was clear that dissent on a mass scale was possible. I think that that was one of the most important things about Seattle. And maybe that is one of the most important things about those mass demonstrations. We also struggling with this, the, the fact that um, the media is so corporatized and mm. so for information you have to go to alternative mm. media sources which many of us go to but everyone can't go to them you mm. know you have to have uh, certain kinds of access in order to find alternative sources as well mm. um, but you know I think in terms of uh, the fact that we are working you talked about the Swedish state you know I would say the US state is like you know the most depressing <laughs> <laughs> state that uh, we we've, we've had in the I don't know, and um, it's a very unabashedly imperial state right now, and uh, whether the elections um, next year will change that, I have very I, I don't know I don't think so, I think the same kinds of policies will continue you know whether. Um, I think there will be a difference if uh, there are Democrats in power. I think one of the differences will be that perhaps 
the religious right, um, you know, um, will not be as centrally involved in governance, governance as it is now, which is another whole. And you know, this is the other way in which uh, what what the U.S. state uh, has done recently is is um, all the fatherhood initiatives and faith-based initiatives. That's a, a very important place to look at how normative heterosexuality is being re-threaded and recast in popular culture. Okay, yeah. that is just a perfect place to look at it. Again, the the uh, don't ask, don't tell gays in the military. The whole debate around that is another yeah. place to look at how heterosexualization is a very important part of the state apparatus, especially. Uh, states that are corporatized and imperial states, you know, those are part of the ruling practices. You yeah. have to see it. You have to pay attention to the connections between all of them. Anyway, it's an aside. Um, so I think that with this state, I mean, um, I don't know that I can talk about what would be successful, but I think that um, there are struggles and there are um, people in different places that that are coming up with alternative um, economic arrangements or um, a different kind of um, basis of subsistence in the north you know um, and I think that those are all those everyday practices to me are as important to pay attention to and to be clear about, there's something called community-supported agriculture, right? Mm. Which is um, uh, farmers who um, who farm uh, on the basis of support from an entire community that commits uh, to to subsidizing the farming, small small farmers, right? And buying the product, whatever the product is, whether it's huge or little. Okay, mm. so that's community-supported agriculture. It's a very small thing, but it it pushes back against agribusiness. Mm. It pushes back against certain kinds of ways in which um, you know the the world we live in is is totally governed by certain kind of corporatized institutions. Mm. So I think that everyday practices or or certain kinds of alternative institution building within various communities is very crucial. And to go to my, that point I made about um, toxic dumping, right? One of the points I was trying to make is that um, it, some of the struggles that poor women have been involved in all over the world have to do with their own neighborhoods and communities. So when it is a struggle that affects an entire neighborhood, it is always women who are in the leadership. And you can look all over Latin America, you can look in the US, lots of other places, right? And so one of the, uh, the struggles in this country, which has been really led by um, poor women of color in inner city areas, and this is true even of Syracuse, which is you know um, down the street from us where I teach, um, a struggle against um, environmental pollution, right? Where corporations, and again, privatized corporations, um, come into uh, what is seen as an economically devastated area. And usually those are inner city areas, or even rural areas, which have no, which are seen as economically devastated. So no economic, um, uh, no possibility of anything else and also the assumption being that there is no if there's economic devastation then there is no political power among the people in that context so then the corporations can basically make make that area into a toxic dump okay and so some of the struggles you know which of course women have said no to in those communities and so some of the most uh, urgent but also successful struggles against what is called environmental racism, you know, mm -hmm. has been by these poor women of color on the basis of, um, you know, the devastation of their communities due to toxic dumps. And they have managed to, in some cases, get corporations to 
to move, to mm. take it out of there. You know, in Syracuse, there's this whole struggle going on around um, Onondaga Lake, which is polluted. Mm. And, um, the, you know, so, so there's a struggle about uh, which, who can come in and uh, sort of have access to this and what will it do to the communities that live, you know, in that area. Mm. Um, and they happen to be poor black communities. Mm. It was also because of industry that now has fled, mm. you know. Um, actually, I'm, I'm trying to think, I think it was, um, it's Lockheed Martin, in fact, mm -hmm. which is one of the largest military defense contractors, mm -hmm. you know, that has been established in Syracuse for a long time. Mm -hmm. So it's a very, um, see, again, it's so interesting, all those connections, you know, between the military and militarization and um, uh, the effects of, mm -hmm. of, this is another form of thinking about militarization, I think, is in all of the different industries that are connected to the making of a militarized, a highly militarized society, one where um, it is assumed that security is, um, uh, the only way to have security is through military and policing. Since I came to this country since the 80s, I have never thought that I have really uh, lived in, in a democratic society or democratic culture. I think that there are certain formal mechanisms of democracy that work in this country and that are protected in this country, which are very important, you know, which are not available in some other parts of the world. But I think that there's, there is also... Um, I mean, I, I'll give you an example. I remember listening to a talk by um, uh, the Latin American intellectual um, Ariel Dorfman, mm -hmm. you know, and um, he talked about how people are always, um, you know, talking about uh, totalitarian regimes in Latin America and and how, you know, in the, in the U.S. people have freedom of... Um, speech and, and how um, there's no cens censorship and, you know, um, how authoritarian regimes exercise, you know, serious censorship on what people can say and so on. And he said, you know, what has always interested him was that um, in this country is the highest level of self-censorship that he's ever experienced, you know. So even people don't even allow themselves to articulate something because it has been stopped somewhere else, right? Which is a very interesting comment, you know, about what then, what is democratic culture if, in fact, people, there's a belief that there's freedom of assembly, speech, and so on, and yet there are certain things that because they are not in the landscape that you grew up in, you, you can't even imagine or speak it or fight it, you know? Whereas oftentimes in... You know, it, in authoritarian regimes, the, the power is very blunt and clear. I mean, one of the, to me, pedagogically, one of the things that has happened is, is that the, um, um, the, the fact that in the U.S. now, um, the exercise of power is so raw around yeah. us has meant, actually, that, that it's possible to, in fact, talk about um, you know, U.S. US um, culpability, accountability, and all of these things, where before, you know, it was, it, uh, it worked in similar ways, but it wasn't as explicit, you know. So the imperial projects are right out there. Hmm. And so now you can actually say, so, is it possible to talk about the U.S. as a democratic state, if it, just internally, if it is actually an imperial state externally? Do you not have to bring those two together? I mean, it's not mm. possible to just say, okay, democracy exists here, and you know, mm. you're bringing democracy elsewhere. You cannot bring democracy to anybody. Mm. People, you can't gift a group of people with democracy or freedom. Freedom can't be a gift. People have to 
people struggle for it on their own you know mm. you win it you you achieve it you can't be given it mm. it it doesn't it, that's not i mean if you take especially if you mm. take you know some of the things that said earlier about decolonization seriously you know mm. just the decolonization just a, a a colonizing power moving out of a country does not mean that the country is free in terms of people mm. in terms of how people think in terms of how people feel or what they are able to imagine for themselves what they often put in place is a neo colonial regime mm. which is of course what many of our experiences have been mm. which are always very nationalist and masculinist at mm. the same time we need to make the distinction between the people of a country and and the government of a country because the government many times does not represent the interests of the people at all mm. and does not it's only representing its own interests i don't know i guess i think that there are many large struggles ahead of us and i think that you know the way to think about winning struggles is to be to be clear that these struggles are actually happening around the world in various places around the world um and that you know history really teaches us that profound changes are possible i mm. think if people respond and if people resist i mean i really i i do believe in in revolution what that means in different sites and in different contexts i think one would have to to really look at and think think about carefully because it may not look the same and it may not be the same so the zapatista movement is a revolution but will we be able to reproduce the zapatista movement in the us i don't think so at all indigenous communities in the us have uh you know a very clear critique of um colonization and genocide of the U- by the us state historically and uh, a claim for sovereignty right but it's also the case that they are working within the context of uh, a us national landscape which is um very corporate and consumer oriented right um so the struggles and the models that uh, indigenous communities come up with in the us actually are, are you know different and and uh, the tactics are different mm. the mohawk struggle i mean people had militant uh, armed struggle um in various places in canada and the us and so on mm. hasn't happened in a long time in the us mm. um but it's a very different history of struggle than for instance the struggle for civil rights mm. in this country where the struggle for civil rights was a struggle to become part of a polity mm. that was um um that treated black people as less than equal mm. right so but native americans american indian struggle is not always and in fact uh, most of the the nations i know and the people i know who are writing within this it's not about civil rights mm. because they reject the us mm. as the nation that they want to belong to mm. you know so they're very different genealogies of struggle and very different kind of histories and and tactics that people end up following my sense is that all of these things are really crucial and mm. really important um and no one i mean no one thing is going to get us um what we want and i i really uh I think it's important to always um look at a situation carefully, look at the history of the situation, look at the relationships within that context and ask the question of so what is it what are the stories that that I have been told about this and how have the stories have the stories left out you know particular things that I need to know in order to really understand and figure out what form of resistance will work 
you know. I think that in my context as a teacher, I have found that some of the most radical activity that I can engage in is to provide um, students with alternative narratives and histories to the ones that they take for granted. Yeah. And, and that shakes up the, the paradigm yeah. um, that, that has been normalized. Even right now, you know, to think about war and to think about the stories uh, that people have about men in leadership in war and to raise questions about, you know, where are the women and what positions do they occupy, which women occupy what positions, how does the story that you know actually account for their lives and does the story you know um, allow them any agency at all and why not should they not be allowed agency right so in the same way as you know you have the third world woman as victim you ask the same kind of question you turn it on its head and say so if you didn't think about women workers in Sri Lanka or India or anywhere as victims mm -hmm. but you you began from the place that they sit and what they see how they organize how they analyze what's happening to them Right, and then use that as a way to complicate your, the narrative that you have taken for granted always. Mm. You know, then what does that say to you about um, what a just society looks like, or what value, what what kind of values you have about human life? You know, um, is one more valuable than the other? But those kinds of questions, I think, you know, the ethical questions then become possible. I think one of, for me, one of the effects of the naturalization of certain capitalist values, and by that I mean um, competitiveness, the assumption that success means wealth, that wealth uh, and success are just, that's it. Mm. Um, that uh, somebody, that, that being able to be a good consumer is uh, a, a major value, that ownership is uh, is not even questioned. Um, and th those kinds of things that become just totally naturalized, which undermine any kind of notion of interdependence, interdependency, collaboration, um, it, you know, um, inequality or the connection between privilege and uh, domination. Mm. That connection gets severed. Mm. I mean, that is one way in which capitalism is naturalized. Is that people stop seeing that the fact that they are rich has something to do with the fact that huge numbers of people are poor. You just, that's it, you know? But if you start from the other place, right? You start from the place of people who are actually fighting those forms of domination, yeah. right? Um, and who are therefore, you know, they, they can't afford not to see what's yeah. going on <laughs> because they need to get out of that situation real yeah. quick. You know, but you start from that place and then you look up the power structure and you start posing questions about what the cost of privilege is, right? Mm. And are you willing to live with that cost? You know, I think that that ends up actually really getting people, you know, when, when we are successful at that, that really gets people to, um, to perhaps make some different choices mm. about their own lives and what they will do with it. Because I think part of the way privilege works, I mean, privilege really works by reproducing itself. It constantly mm. reproduces itself. So you gotta interrupt that, you know? Um, and I think so, so counter narratives. I think that, I don't know, I think resistance will, needs to work at all kinds of different levels. And the best resistance is that which begins in the place that you're at. And this is like a, a, a motto of all organizers. You begin mm. where you are and you, you look around you and who's around you and who are the people you're in touch with and what are their lives like and what would it take? Is that the group that you're working with? Then what does it take for this particular group of people to come to some collective understanding, right, of the conditions of their lives and what it's how the conditions of their lives are connected to 
the conditions of lives of people in different places in the world, you know. And I think that that's the best way that people organize. Organizers who are successful are really able to do that, you know, to really begin where they are and then. It is very much the history of labor in this country is very much the history of race and gender. Okay, they go like this. And I think that's true anywhere. But it's fascinating to look at it in this country okay. because um, particular groups of women from different communities um, you know, have historically in this country occupied different parts of the labor market. And they've been segmented, saturated in those places. And I think that it's important to understand how race and gender are integrally connected to the history of capitalism and labor and the building of the United States as a nation. Okay, so the US becomes a nation through those three interconnected histories. Okay, so particular groups of people get exploited mm. and super exploited in certain ways and that's totally connected to a whole other set of people who are exploited in a whole other different way, right? And so, um, you know, so then you have, um, you still have sweatshop labor, you still have uh, women in Silicon Valley, um, you still have the preponderance of homework, which is, or piecework, which is a huge, huge part of what is happening with immigrant labor, specifically women worker, immigrant women um, in the US. And um, the way that level of super exploitation works, I think, is through the mobilizing of gendered and racialized ideologies. Yeah. Right. And so that's where I think uh, an anti-capitalist analysis or a socialist or a Marxist analysis that doesn't pay attention to how race and gender are mobilized in the service of profit, right, fail to actually both understand what's going on, right, and also uh, find um, a way to actually organize across those boundaries, you know. Um, in the early 20th century in this country, the Communist Party um, actually was successful was one of the few places, few groups that were successful in organizing black and white workers together in, in the shipbuilding industry, I think. So, um, but again, you know, you know what happened to the Communist Party. Um, so it has always, so, so there's always been, I think, uh, a lot at stake in workers from different, um, racialized and gendered groups and identities finding ways to work together and organize together. That has been always, because that they've always been separated yeah. by the way um, capital has functioned. You know? And so I think there's no way to really understand, um, I don't know, I don't know how you can even talk about any form of a proletariat without racing and gendering it right now and also making it um, um, making it uh, geographically understanding it geographically in terms of where people are located and how they're connected to the larger systems mm -hmm. you know so I think I mean, this is very much a reality of what's, what is uh, happening right now. It's incredible, mm. actually. Um, so you think that, um, at least here, that we live in a culture where people are attentive mm. to and are trying to not be racist and not be whatever, but um, all you have to do is to look at, look at all these patterns and groups of people concentrated in all these different places to know that this is not. What's amazing to me is that the working conditions, there aren't that many differences, hmm. you know, when, when you go to, um, when you look at working conditions in the North and the South, 
mm. for particular groups of women workers who are seen as the most expendable um, and exploitable labor. Mm. So, which, which, makes, which makes sense because, you know, this is where the, the, uh, the most amount of profit can be extracted and the assumption being that these are the most powerless people. So if they are powerless, then they can't challenge us. Um, and therefore, I think that, that some of the most important struggles are, are transnationally, you know, mm. women worker struggles across, across borders. Mm. If, if I live here, mm. and if I've lived here for, for this long, it is really my responsibility to, to engage in what is happening here, mm. which has devastating effects. Mm for everyone around mm. the world. I mean, mm. it's, this is the weird thing about living here. Mm. It's both the most hopelessly depressing thing, <laughs> <laughs> do you know? I mean, because, because uh, things are happening around you that are just phenomenally oppressive. Mm. Um, and it is also one of the most urgent and important things to be living here mm. now, because there's so much work to be done here. Mm. You know, and you, you can't not do the work. I may mm. feel like an outsider, and I am an outsider, but I'm still on the inside in the sense that there is a certain amount of power I can have, and there are privileges I have. Mm. And so then the question becomes, so how, what am I doing with my power and my privileges? You know, and then, and there are, so, so that, and to me that's the question people who live here need to ask, mm. is, what are the privileges you have, right? And what are you doing with those privileges? Not just for yourself, because that's easy. Everybody can do it for themselves. Mm -hmm. But what are you doing for what's happening in the world and for what the US is doing in the world, really?